Let's go back to those uh, glorious days of yesteryear. It's, uh, it's 1960, and uh, young Bobby Mance is out in the world. How, how did you get involved with the Mets? I mean, what were you doing, and why did you become attracted to, to, to them? I mean, this is a whole new enterprise. Have you been a baseball fan? Well, I was a Dodger fan, and uh, when the Dodgers left in 1957, I was shattered. And uh, I remember my brother would try to get me to go down to Saint, uh, down to Philadelphia. He'd say, "Let's go down and watch a, a Dodger game," you know. And I'd say, "I wouldn't cross the street to see those guys," you know. But I always maintained my interest in baseball. I, I still enjoyed it, and I knew about the Mets. You know, I knew about the Continental League. I was aware of the fact that. Uh, the Continental League became the two teams, the Mets and Houston, and I was working in a bank at the time, and I was uh, originally 1A, and I had hurt my foot playing football. And w I was drafted, I left the bank, had a big party, show up at Whitehall Street, they take my physical, they say, you got a spongy ankle, it's, uh, it's uh, a little chronic, uh, we're gonna let you have a six month deferment. So I get a six month deferment, which makes me one uh, makes me four F now. So I go back with my tail between my legs. I go back to the bank. <clears throat> I get my job back. I wait for like one year. I don't get called. Never got called again. Meanwhile, a friend of mine, Bob Elliott, had gone to work for. This is not the ball player. This is a classmate of mine from St. John's. He went to work for the Mets, who had become the National League entry in the National League. Uh, they had a lot of the people from the old Continental League were sort of subsumed by the Mets, like Johnny Murphy and Rose Trotter and Lou Niss and a handful of other people who had worked for the Continental League now work for the New York Mets. And uh, they were all over at uh, uh, the Hotel Martinique, which was on 32nd Street, and was a real flea bag. Uh, Howard Close had donated to the Mets. They were, they were one of our original sponsors. And they had donated a basement to us, which became the ticket office and business office for the Mets. Meanwhile, at 685th Avenue, we had an executive office where George Weiss and the baseball department, et cetera, were billeted. Uh, I went over there for an interview at the request of my friend Bob Elliott, who said, come on over, you'll love this place, it's great. Uh, big Jim Thompson is a fun guy to work for. We have this guy, Jim Dusenberry who used to be uh, a big oil executive or whatever. Actually, what he was was a uh, uh, Democratic Party uh, payoff kind of guy. You know, they, they had taken care of him. They gave him a job in the, uh, in the Far East, and he worked with Arabs and stuff on oil wells and things, but he wasn't really an oil man. Uh, he was a Princeton graduate, though, and he was a lot of fun. He, he, he became the guy who was in charge of all the Diamond Club hostesses, uh, he was our man up in the Diamond Club when we first started at, at uh, Shea Stadium. Anyway, I took the job in, um, in December, and, my, and my, my friend, Mr. James K. Thompson, said to me, can you start tomorrow? And I said, no, I can't. I have to give at least two weeks' notice to the bank. I was working for Marine Midland. So I went to Marine Midland. I told him I was leaving. and. Uh, I started on January the 8th with the New York Mets in this basement at the Hotel Martinique. And the first job that I did was they, there was a barrel of requests from uh, people who had asked about the New York Mets and they wanted a schedule or they wanted information about how to buy a season plan or can I get a picture. The teams had been announced by that time. We had had, our, I think it was 22 picks that we had uh, from the rest of the uh, leagues. And uh, Mr. Weiss had decided that rather than go for youth, we were going to go for some names because we were in New York. And he felt that uh, no one would come to see a bunch of rookies. Uh, Houston, when they came into the league, took the opposite tack. They brought in a lot of rookies and no big names. And uh, they had more success than we did. But we did have some name recognition with uh, Bell and Hodges and uh, Mantia and uh, Charlie Neal and people like that. Uh, Oops, the first job that I did when I saw this, this barrel of requests, I had come from a bank situation, so I said to the fellows who were working there, some of whom had come from the Giants, some from the Dodgers, and some from the Yankees. They were ticket department personnel for the most part. I said, uh, we have to put this stuff in alphabetical order, otherwise we're not going to know what we're doing. You know? So 
I had a pretty good system, and I had that stuff alphabetized by the end of that first day. And we started calling these people back then and telling them that the schedule was being produced or the brochure was being made. I'll tell you one thing. In those days, everything was a big deal. Everything was a milestone. When you came out with your first brochure, you were tickled silly. When you came out with a schedule, everybody was excited about it. You know, it was, it was like a baby being born, you know. Uh, in fact, when we had the uh, schedule, when it came out, it was about seven pages or eight pages. It had a map of the polar grounds and the schedule and how to get there and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Within a half an hour, we had a phone call from someone telling us that there were kids up in Harlem near the polar grounds selling these things for a quarter apiece. They'd come down to the Hotel Martinique and grabbed a handful, got on the train and went right up to the polar grounds. Anyway, uh, one of the fellows from the Dodgers said, this guy's got a mind of his own. When I said, we have to start calling all these people up now, I wanted to get going, you know. Let's get these seats sold, you know. So we used to go up, we'd meet customers up, on, uh, up, on, up in Holland. We'd meet them on the corner of 8th Avenue and 155th Street. I'd be up there shivering in the wintertime, waiting for someone to come up. This was uh, January, February, waiting for someone to meet me on this corner. And we'd go into the polo grounds, and it would be windswept and snowy and whatnot, and, and all the seats were broken, and half of them were broken anyway. And we'd put flags on first base, second base, third base, so that you could see where the bags were, you know, through the snow. Anyway, we did sell quite a few seats. We, we had a season sale that first year of approximately 2,000 seats. And when the Giants left in 1957, I think they had a season sale of six to 700 seats. So we, we, uh, we tripled what they had sold. We created some new boxes up there. They only had four rows of boxes, two rows to a box, so it was eight rows of seats. Uh, up to a traffic aisle, and then there was one more row of boxes, E row, was A, B, C, D, a traffic aisle, and E, and the rest of the stuff was reserved seats. So we took, we took those reserved seats up to the poles, which were about 10 rows of seats, and we converted them into boxes, and we put railing, pipe railings on them, and we created a lot of seats that were really good. I mean, we, we were going to charge more money for them. Uh, I think the Giants were charging 250 and 350. 250 for the reserves and 350 for the boxes, and we did the same thing, except for some of the 250 seats we converted them to boxes and charged 350. When you think of the prices today, you know it's it's almost laughable that the prices were so cheap. Uh, we created a small bar room which we called the Mets Lounge. It was a cinder block room that Harry M. Stevens let us have. They set up a bar. They put a bartender behind it. And at the end of the game, people would wander down there and have a drink to beat the traffic, you know, to get out of the place. Not that we were drawing that well, but we did hit a million that first year, mainly due to the Dodgers and Giants who came in on uh, the end of May, the Memorial Day holiday, and the first, second, and third of June, which reminds me that when we played the Giants on the first, second, and third, in one of those games, it might have been the second game, we had the three Alou brothers playing the outfield for the first time ever. Three, three brothers played right field, left field, and center field. Anyway, getting back to the Martinique, the Martinique was a, was a horrible, horrible place to work. It was dirty. It was, uh, it was filled with crime. You were afraid to go to the men's room or, or the ladies' room, for that matter. So finally, the Mets broke down and rented a uh, room for us so that if somebody had to go to the bathroom or something, they could go up to the room. My then boss, who had come over from Yankees, was a fellow by the name of Vinny Alellis. And to this day, he's probably the smartest ticket guy that I ever met. He, he could run rings around everybody. Uh, he had known Thompson from the Yankees because Jim Thompson had been with the Yankees and left when uh, Casey Stengel and George Weiss left. Jim left. There was a whole exodus of people who got out of Yankee Stadium at, the, at that time, and we inherited some of those. We also had some people from the Dodgers. In addition to the ticket department people, we had Matt Burns, who had been uh, in the uh, scouting or minor league department over at uh, Ebbets Field, uh, he became our man at Shea Stadium. Uh, the ground had been broken in October of 1961. We had a representation in the, uh, in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I think Casey Stengel was there uh, that, first, that first year that we hadn't even started yet. <coughs> and. Uh, we went to the poll. I went to Penn Station to sell tickets once we got our tickets in. Uh, and another fellow, Hank Kelly, who later became a scout for us, 
he went to Grand Central. And the two of us would work from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock at night, uh, Monday to Friday. And on Saturday, we worked from 9 to 4. No relief. Uh, if you had to go to the head, if you had to go to the bank, if you had to go get some lunch, I would put a sign there, be back in 10 minutes. And I had it down to a science. I could go to the men's room. I could go to the bank and make a deposit. I could stop at Needix and get a hot dog and a soda and get back in 10 minutes. Invariably, the phone would ring, and my boss would say to me, where were you? We had three phone calls. They said they'd been waiting a half an hour. You know, I mean, you'd go half the day without a sale, and of course, the one 10-minute break that you'd take, there'd be someone coming. Anyway, I worked in the Long Island waiting room, and uh, half the questions that I fielded all day long was, what, what time is the train to Huntington? Because I was, I, the funny part about it is I'm standing behind a counter that has an enormous picture of the Met logo behind me. It, it, the thing was probably about four feet in diameter, mm -hmm. in full color, blue and orange. And people would still come up to me and they would say, can you tell me what time the train is? You know, this is the Mets, you know. After a while, I got a hold of some of the schedules for the train so that at least I would be able to hand them a schedule and, and, and not just send them away. I thought that maybe public relations-wise, they might stick around and buy some tickets. Uh, I worked at Penn Station from March of 19, we opened up in the end of March, the end of February, the beginning of March. And I worked there until June in 1962 when I was called up to the polo grounds. And when I went up to the polo grounds, uh, they put me in charge of priorities. I was handling priority tickets, which would have been the VIPs and ball players' tickets, the press, et cetera. And towards the end of the year, I also started handling the mail department. <clears throat> At the end of 1962, we had already made up a diagram. Our first diagram was, uh, the city didn't want to pay for a diagram, and the Mets didn't want to pay for a diagram. We felt we needed a diagram to sell tickets, so we had blueprints. And it was my job to take each page of blueprints, which, you know, blueprint size, and I would take a magic marker, and I would color in the aisles, and I would write in the numbers of the seats, and I made kind of a usable section. I cut all the sections out, pasted them together. We had a big room up there, which was George Weiss's office. I put all these sections on the floor. We had a, a photo team come in from a, a fairly well-known photographer's st uh, studio over in uh, Madison Avenue, and they took an overhead shot of these things. I still have a handful of them. We had, it was a black background, and it would be the mezzanine. It would show you every section, and if you really look close, took a magnifying glass, you would see seats one, two, three, et cetera, which I had drawn in. We used those diagrams, I would say, through 1964, 65, over at the Shea Stadium when we finally went there. Mm -hmm. The plan was that we were going to move into Shea Stadium in 1963. All the work was going to be finished by 1963. Well, after our initial season at the Polo Grounds, we started to realize that this stadium is probably not going to be done in time for us to start the season in 1963. But we were getting the word that we're probably going to be in there by June. So what we did that, that winter of 1963, we ordered season books. At that time, they sold, they sold the season tickets in little booklets of paper tickets. We ordered them from uh, April through June, <coughs> with the idea in mind that we would either be making up other books showing Shea Stadium locations and doing a separate mailing, or we would continue the print of the Polo Grounds and still have a separate mailing. Well, it wasn't too long after we mailed the, uh, the first batch out that we realized uh, that we were not going to be at Shea Stadium in 1963, so we had to print up the rest of the uh, locations for, for the Polo Grounds. We mailed them out. Now, the reason why I mention this story is because it, it did get us one leg up the ladder, though, because we, on the application that we were sending out, we were putting the Polo Grounds location, and right next to it, we were writing in the Shea Stadium location, which we had done off these, these prints that I had made up. And it, it saved us a lot of work later on, because uh, when we did get around to mailing out the, the Shea Stadium application in the winter of 1963, 
uh, people already knew where they were going to be seated. They, they, it was marked off on a diagram, and we told them that if they wanted to come out and view the seats, they could. The problem was most of the seats weren't in the ballpark yet uh, and didn't get in the ballpark until, I'd say, pretty, pretty much mid-March. Because I remember one time there was a writer for the uh, Mirror by the name of Milk Gross, whose daughter still works for the New York Times, Jane Gross. But Milk... No, he worked for the Post. Uh, he worked for the Post, right. you're right. He was a columnist for the Post. Right. <laughs> and Milk Gross called Jim Thompson up and he said he wanted to do a story on Shea Stadium and he wanted to come out to Shea and would it be okay for him to come out on a particular Saturday in March, I believe it was. And Jim called me up and said, Milk Gross is coming out. Will you give him the grand tour of Shea Stadium? So I said, sure, I will. Well, Milk Gross was uh, a pretty active guy for his age, and he really ran me through my traces because we wound up in the upper deck, and none of the seats were in in the upper deck. And this was the beginning. This was the, maybe the first week of, uh, of March. And we're climbing up concrete slabs to get to the last row because he wanted to see what Shea Stadium looked like from the roof. And I went, that's the first time I had been up there. Later, I did climb the ladder and went up the hatch at a future date and went up on the roof to see what it looked like up there. But Milk Gross was the first guy who got me to go in the back row of the upper deck. I had been, uh, I had been on the uh, concourse areas, but I had never gone into the seat areas. <clears throat> anyway, little by little, the ballpark started to get finished. When we, when we first moved into Shea Stadium, we were like the Marines. Uh, in December of 1963, Jim Thompson said, we have good news, we're going to move into Shea Stadium so we can get a C of O. We're going to be moving out there. And the first guys who are going to be moving into, the Shea Sta into Shea Stadium are the ticket office. Well, we were pretty happy about it. I think it was on December 13th or 14th. You could, as Casey would say, you could probably look it up. but. We went out to Shea Stadium. Well, the wind was howling. It was, there was a storm going on, and we moved into Shea Stadium. Shea Stadium had no heat. They had electric heaters that were hanging on the wall. Uh, certain places did not have electric heaters, so they were just like refrigerators. One of those places was the vault. And when we got our tickets, and the, the vault guys would put on their, their overcoat and their hat. It was like butchers in the old days going into the, into the locker, into the uh, ice box, you know. Uh, and I'll never forget those guys. We had shelves in there where we had the tickets and they'd have to go in there to bring out the tickets so we could count them or whatever or distribute them or charge them out to a different outlet or whatever. And these guys would put their hat and coat on and go in there and everybody would be laughing. You know, you could see steam coming out of their mouth. And <clears throat> we had chemical, chemical toilets, uh, which looked like, um, they looked like a big Coke machine. And uh, it had a hatch on the top of it and you was, you put your hands on this thing and yank yourself up and sit on this thing. Well, the women balked. The women said, there's no way. There was a, one in the ladies, what was going to be the ladies' room, and there was one in what, what became the men's room. But there was no plumbing in, in these rooms, so they had these machines, these, these uh, gadgets that we were supposed to sit on and go to the bathroom. And, and every, every couple of days or so, there would be a truck that would pull up to the official lot and it would say danger, poison all over it, and they would run this big hose into these machines and suck all this stuff out. I mean, it was really unbelievable. We'd have customers walking down the, uh, the corridor to come in and buy tickets and this machine out front saying poison. And Anyway, <clears throat> we used to have bathroom runs because the, the rest of the Met organization were over at the Traveler's Hotel, which was over by LaGuardia Airport, which at that time wasn't a bad hotel. Uh, they gave us a whole bunch of rooms over there, and we had our executive offices over there. That's where uh, Jim Thompson was, and uh, our PR department and our promo department were all loca located over there. We still had the real executive office with George Weiss, et cetera, over in the city. Uh, for many years, the Mets maintained the New York office as well as an office at Shea Stadium. Anyway, we, we told the women that we would take them over to uh, Traveler's Hotel at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's the way it was. We had these, these station wagons that uh, Buick had given us uh, that had Buick all over them, said Mets and Buick, and uh, the girls would pile into the truck, into the station wagon, they'd bring them over there for a bathroom run. Uh, the, uh, the Buicks remind me of a story when, uh, when we were up at the Polo Grounds, uh, Freddie Hutchinson, 
was the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. And the Mets, we either beat them four in a row or three, in a, three out of four. I forget now. Anyway, on a Sunday, I think we beat him in a doubleheader. He destroyed the clubhouse. He told all the ball players get out, and he he just ripped the clubhouse apart. After he had calmed down, he went down to Tut Shores. When he went down to Tut Shores, he ran into Casey Stengel and Jules Ox Adler. Julie Adler was our promotion director, and they were standing at the bar having a drink. And they said to Freddie, "Come on over and have a drink." And he blanked, he blanked them for a minute. He said, "I don't want to drink with you guys. You know, you just beat my team." And his team was pretty good. I mean, they had won the pennant the year before or two years before. Anyway, uh, he did wind up having a drink with them. At the end of the night, Casey always stayed at the Essex house. So they said to uh, Freddie, come on, we'll give you a lift home. So they get outside, and there's this Buick with New York Mets all over it. He said, you sons of bitches, I'm not driving with you. And he walked home. Anyway, uh, where are we now? <laughs> In... Um... <laughs> When you, when, when you come out to Shea Stadium, the, the, the place isn't finished, and it's a year behind schedule, and still the, the World's Fair is coming, and you get an enormous amount of ticket requests. I mean, all of a sudden, there's a lot more interest. I mean, I think the last year in the Polo Grounds, you didn't quite draw a million. Right, we were 980,000 or something. Right. And then you come out here, and what happened? Well, we drew a million seven. And in those days, you counted the attendance by the actual number of uh, S's in the seats. So today, they're announcing a sale figure. Uh, we probably sold two million tickets that first year with maybe 300,000 no-shows. Because when you have a season sale, there's always going to be a bunch of no-shows. Anyway, when we came out here, uh, uh, let's see, Herb Heft was our PR director in, in 1964, and he was a guy who had come out of uh, Minnesota, I think. I think he had been with the Twins, and he was a super guy. His brother was Arnie Heft, who owned the, uh, it was either Washington. He an NBA referee. Uh, yeah, but he, he wound up owning a club. That's right. And that's how we, that's how, that's how we eventually lost him. He went down to work for his brother, but... Uh, he was a super guy, and I remember when I went to, I had been to Shea Stadium a few times, but now we're going to Shea Stadium for, for good. We're going to move out there. We're going to actually be in an office, you know. When I walk in, there's newspaper guys all over the place. There's cameramen. There's everything going. I knew nothing about this. He had set this all up. I was a, a kid. I was 26 years old or something like that, and I certainly was not sophisticated when it came to dealing with the TV, and I'm walking in, and they have a customer lined up, and she's going to be the first customer who's going to buy a season seat. And she was pretty legit. She was just some woman who had come by, but they, they kind of liked her look. She was not a kid. Mm -hmm. She was a mature woman. She was older than me. She might have been 40-ish or something like that. And she's going to buy the first four seats at Shea Stadium, you know. And uh, Herb had set this whole thing up. And when I walked into the back room of the ticket office, there's all these cameras. And there was a window back there with bars on it, which they thought would be a great idea. It would look like I'm behind the window, you know, looking at her. And I, it looked so stupid that finally they let me come out from behind the window. And there was a little counter there. And we were just, I'm showing her my famous diagram, you know, pointing out where her seats are going to be. Anyway, we did get through those days. Uh, the ballpark was being completed as we were working each day. Every day there would be a little more done. Uh, seats were coming in. There, there was uh, cement being uh, being poured. There were slabs coming in. Uh, I remember taking uh, M. Donald Grant's sons on a tour of the Diamond Club, which was our restaurant on the fourth floor, on a Sunday after mass. They had come over after church, and the pl I mean the workmen were all over the place. This was literally weeks before the opener. And you would never in a million years dream that this was going to be a usable bar. I mean, it was just plasterers and painters and wires and everything was hanging all over the place because the, the ceiling at the uh, Diamond Club was a plaster ceiling with the recessed lighting. And uh, the, bar, the bar was one of the bar at that time was the longest bar in New York. It was a, it was a huge oval-shaped bar. It's probably still in the top five in New York. I mean, they don't make bars that big anymore. Uh, it w there was a ceramic tile floor, so there were all kinds of workmen. The bathrooms were being put together, painters were painting, and the, and the Diamond Club consists of two rooms. You know, there's a bar room, and then there's a restaurant room, and there's a large lobby. Well, Tim Grant almost got decapitated up there because he's walking around looking at everything, and 
and there was a wire strung across, and I grabbed them by the neck and I pulled them under it. You know, I said, "Watch out!" You know, because we we shouldn't have been there. We were on an active construction site. We had no hard hats or anything. We were just wandering around like tourists, you know. Uh, and it was the blind, literally leading the blind, because I hadn't been in that room myself, and I'm sh I knew it from drawings. I knew what what the thing was supposed to look like. Uh, Duke Dusenberry, the fellow I mentioned earlier, eventually became our man up in the Diamond Club. He watched out for our interests, and he used to hire the Diamond Club hostesses. And in those days, if you wore a hat in the Diamond Club, the Duke would come over to you and he would say, you have to remove your hat. It was on the back of the ticket. It would say, gentlemen, must not wear hats and can't wear windbreakers and you can't do that. Uh, I mean, today you can practically come in in a barrel, but in, in those days, you, you had a dress, you know, the Diamond Club was kind of exclusive and it was kind of classy. And uh, Duke would go over to those people and he would say, if they had a baseball cap, well, people didn't wear baseball caps in those days, they wore fedoras. And it, he would go to them and he would say, excuse me, sir, you have to remove your hat. And I remember one time he went back to the guy and he said, excuse me, sir, you have to remove your hat. And the third time he went back, he just took it right off his head. And, you know, today you'd be rolling around in the gutter on that, you know. But anyway, uh, I remember that night before opening day, uh, there was a there was a bad spot by first base. There was a decline, and I remember John McCarthy was the groundskeeper, and Pete Flynn, who was our groundskeeper today, was the lead man. He was his brother-in-law, as a matter of fact. He had come over from Ireland a few years before, and they were patching that up. And it's a hard thing to fix a dirt infield when you're going to be using it the next day because there's, it's a mixture of clay and sand and a material that's like kitty litter and uh, they were fixing that. There were painters out in right field painting the fence, and some of the grounds keepers were putting down sod. And meanwhile, Harry M. Stevens was all over the building that night because they were installing uh, the, the refrigerators that had come in, but they were getting a lot of deliveries. They were getting soda deliveries, they were getting beer deliveries, they were getting frankfurters, and they were putting this stuff all over the building in various uh, lockers and, uh, and refrigerators. And I remember being upstairs with uh, my secretary and Jim Thompson and his friend. And we were sitting up on the press level and we were watching some of the stuff going on. And John uh, Morley, who was the vice president, at that time he wasn't a vice president, he was the manager of, the, uh, of Shea Stadium as far as Harry M. Stevens was concerned. He was leading these guys around the building that were distributing all this food stuff. And I remember he was, I, I'm up sitting in this box, you know, being really amazed at how well this place was being pulled together. And uh, the grass was really green. We had the lights on. It's the first time we really had the lights on uh, that we were giving them this real test, you know. And, and uh, all of a sudden, John lets loose a string of expletives deleted, you know, only they weren't deleted, about something that these guys had done wrong. And I remember Jim Thompson get, just got up and he leaned over and he said, John, there are ladies present. And then Molly looked up and he saw Thompson. He said, oh, sorry, Jim, I didn't know you were there, you know. <laughs> Continued on his merry way, you know. But I, it went right down to the wire. We got to Shea Stadium the next day. <clears throat> there, was <clears throat> there was a communications workers strike over at the World's Fair, which affected Shea Stadium. So there was some wires cut or whatever. We wound up having no phones. The only phone that worked in the building was in my office. The ticket department office of the ticket manager had one phone line working, and somehow Dick Young found out about it. Dick Young was a, a an excellent writer for the New York uh, Daily News. He was my favorite writer when I was a kid, and uh, he found out about it. He came to me and he asked me if he could call in his story. He was the only writer who called in a story from Shea Stadium that day. In those days, they called in stories. They didn't have computers that they getting this instant. Uh, uh, work done. Well, a lot of it went on Western Union. And, and the, they had the wiretaps, too. And you bet. But I remember yeah. Dick took over my office then. He just walked in and closed the door and it wasn't my office anymore, you know. So Dick would do that, yeah. I'm standing out in the hallway wondering when I'm going to get it back because we're trying to balance out this ball game, you know. Anyway, um, we lost that first game, too, unfortunately. We were winning it, too, I think. 5-3, I think. You remember before the game, they were painting the outfield fences? Yeah. 